Thank you, Joe. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited to start off the Jocelyn Jackson Reads with Nikki Salcedo now working with me. Makes me so happy. Nikki and I um, have known each other for years just as members of Atlanta Literati. And we also go to church together um, back when things like church happened. Um, and I'm so excited that the first thing we're going to do in this series is help Jen Phillips, one of my favorite favorite writers, Launch Family Law. Um, if you have not read Jen Phillips before, this is where you should start and then you should just go all the way back and read uh, uh, every single one of her books. I've read all but one, which I am taking on my beach vacation next week, hopefully, hopefully. Um, just fantastic writer. Jen, just really to get us started, why don't you tell us what family law is about? Like, What's the book about? So my last book was about motherhood and in a way this one is too, in a different way. Um, we get, it's about instead of the mothers we're born to, the mothers we choose and the families we create for ourselves. So you have Lucia, who's a young lawyer in her thirties in late 1970s, early 1980s, Montgomery, Alabama, at the time where a woman lawyer was still a rare thing. A woman judge was even rarer. And then you've got 16 year old Rachel, who's a fairly typical teenager with maybe a few more questions than most uh, from a very traditional family and who has had a very distinct idea of what it means to be a woman put on her. So when they come together, uh, their stories intertwine a little bit. Rachel suddenly sees this whole other option. Lucia finds a friendship, but her work has had a certain amount of threat involved with it. And when that threat becomes more violent, then everything shifts for both of them. Yeah, the, um, the inciting incident is, um, I don't think it's a spoiler to talk about the first, the first scene in the book, but mm -hmm. her, her car is vandalized while she is working alone. And, and you know from the very beginning that, um, and, and Lucia is very Southern and very, she's outspoken and she does what she wants, but she's also lovely. Like she's a lovely person. And it's a little bit shocking to feel this level of threat aimed at her. Why do you think she has drawn this kind of, you know, I don't want to put that on her. She hasn't drawn it. It's drawn itself, but is it a time period thing? Is it just basic garden mm -hmm. variety misogyny? Why, I mean, why'd you start this way? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, and, and I think one thing, and again, this sort of played out in my previous book in a, in a different way. I think what we do with fear is very interesting to me. And particularly as women, how you handle threats, how you handle not necessarily just physical threats, but how you deal with a world that is full of danger and possible risk. And so um, I wanted to start out immediately making it clear that she is aware people are offended by what she does, um, that she makes no secret of her politics. Although, yeah, as you say, she is also a very kind and thoughtful person and she can move in between the world she grew up in and the sort of life she's created for herself. And I like the idea of having someone who's smart and ambitious, um, but not a bitch, who, who's that there's somehow like this notion that to be smart and am, um, ambitious, you have to be unpleasant. I don't know where that came from. Uh, but yeah, I you know, think the South, we have, you know, there's fight, flight. And then recently, like in the last 10 years, they were like, oh, there's also freeze. But in the South, we also have politeness. Like it's yes. fight, flight, freeze, or <laughs> manners, which are, can be very deadly here. And when deployed correctly, yes. Vicious, uh, vicious manners. <laughs> but I think she, I think there is some garden variety misogyny there, but I think the time, the time period makes her stand out much more, that no one else is doing what she's doing. And, and I think there is a sense that people are very threatened by that, men and women, that it's still a time when there are very tidy boxes where that people should stay in. Um, and she has and moved out of memory, which is, not, which is sort of a, a small city. Right. So it's not like, you know, way out. It's not a, a rural place where 
it's would be completely unheard of, but it's also not like New York where it might be more common. And it's and we're and we're in the South. Is this why is this why you chose the time period that you did to look at those things or I like the time period because it was right at the cusp of sort of had the ERA going on in the background and just the cusp of where things were about to change. The old systems that said men, women, black, white, right, wrong, all of these lines you're supposed to follow are still pretty hardcore in place. They are starting to shatter. And I found that really interesting, that first wave of women, first wave of women who are starting to decide, I want to work and maybe I don't want to be a teacher or I don't want to be a nurse. Maybe I want to have more options out there. Um, and the girls who are seeing that and just, I like the transitional period. It's also still pretty optimistic. Like now we've been pushing so hard for, I would say, equal pay for so long. Uh, back then, there was some sense like if we just tinker with the laws a little bit, we will we will wipe out injustice in the world, which is which is a nice thought. Sounds <laughs> so cute and nice. Wouldn't that be just so nice? But I mean, but it is like there is there is a kind of a lovely optimism to the book uh, set against this backdrop of some really real pushback that was happening then and that has not stopped at all. And I found the book very, very relevant to today. And I also just, as a person who came of age in the eighties, I think I told you this, like reading it, I would have this weird feeling of deja vu because it would, I, it was almost like I would read things that felt like reading like a memoir that I had written about my actual life. Like <laughs> you so nail how things felt to me then growing up and and how like so w fierce kingdom is definitely a book about motherhood this book is also a book about motherhood lucia's relationship with her mother really matters her relationship with this young girl really matters and her ambivalence and her relationship with the idea of becoming a mother matters too talk about that a little bit right i mean you know I assume there are people out there who grew up to be exactly who their parents raised them to be. Um, I think for most of us, there is some gap between the world we grew up in and expectations placed on us and who we actually wound up being. And I think that gap is interesting. And that plays out particularly with Lucia, who loves her family um, and, and yet who also has some real issues with some of their worldviews and is always trying to wrestle with that. And, you know, I think that's also part of the motherhood issue. She's not necessarily posed, but it's just not that simple. She also loves her marriage as it is. She loves her work as it is. And it's complicated. In some ways, I think she's just, she is a woman who is frustrated with being told everything should be so simple. Um, I also, I do love that you dealt with what I call generational racism, where you have a basically good family who you love very much and your relationships with them are very good, but their worldview has been shaped by forces that haven't necessarily acted on you in the same way. And how do you navigate? I love you very much. Your worldview is abhorrent to me. Right. And you really navigate that very well in this novel, I think. I also like for me, Lucia talks with, uh, with her parents a little bit about like, how she is who they raised her to be mm -hmm. was that your experience too like I'm I am who my parents raised me to be but that ended up surprising them do you know what I mean <laughs> yes and that is a lot of what Lucia's talking about and that and that I felt too I mean the the world I grew up in yes was clearly similar to yours and similar to Rachel's um and in some ways similar to, to Lucia's, that, that she feels like you pushed me. And I, I feel like, I guess we'll see now that this book is out, this is maybe a whole generation of women's experience that you told me to make straight A's. You told me to do everything I could and do well in school and I could do anything I, I wanted. But then I got out of school and you thought I would just stop not be interested or curious about anything else and and just stay here and 
get married and have children and have no interest whatsoever outside of that. And, and that's not what you taught me. You, you taught me something totally different, but you didn't really play that through um, of sort of where that might lead. So, so yeah, I feel like there was a bit of a gap generationally between sort of, we'd like you to be smart. We'd like you to do things, but not those things. <laughs> right. nope. Don't go places, don't do things, um, stop thinking so much. Uh, that, that, yeah, is, is familiar. <laughs> this was very, very, very familiar to me. Um, so I want to tell you guys just a couple of things. The first is, this is a Keep Your Shelf book. You should buy it. And the second is, you should buy it from Eagle Eye Books because we need to be supporting our independent bookstores and getting them through this pandemic because we need them. They forge community. They, if without them, you're just going to have the choice of the 20 books that you get at Target and 10 of them were written by James Patterson or by writers working for James Patterson in his basement. So if you go to the chat, you will see that there is a link to that. You can also, there's another link right above it where you can donate to Decatur Book Fest so that hopefully next year we can have an in-person book festival and you can be in a room with Jen, which would be really, really cool. Um, and lastly, you can use that cha chat panel to join in the conversation and ask questions. Um, I have about a thousand things I want to ask Jen, but all of you, I would like you to be part of that too. So if there's questions you have for Jen about this book or any of her previous work or her career, that is where you can do it. Just put it in the chat and I will um, start bringing you into that conversation. Um, so let's talk about where this book came from for you? Like what sparked the idea? Why did you want to write this book? How is it personal to you? Well, like I said, I, my upbringing is pretty similar to Rachel's. It was, it was quite traditional. Um, and I had a lot of women who, particularly teachers, who in some ways, without me even realizing it, really opened up the world and probably changed the path I took. And uh, uh, and still close to some of them, but I'm really clear on some women who showed me this is a whole different way of being. It's not something I see written about a lot, the notion of women outside of our family who, who really shape us. I found that relationship interesting. Um, and years ago, about 10 years ago, I did it. I was, uh, well, I guess it was more than that. It was back when I was um, still freelancing and I interviewed a lawyer here in Birmingham, Judy Crittenden, a divorce lawyer. And Everyone had told me she was terrifying. And so I was a little nervous of meeting her and she was delightful, really charming and funny. And I, I liked like sort of that huge discrepancy between how she was described and how she was. And her background matches a lot of Lucia's career experience. Um, we, the, um, but I left her office again, more than a decade ago thinking, I'd love to use that, like that feels like the seed of something. And as I started to think about this book, I thought, I wonder what a girl like me raised the way I was raised uh, would have thought about a woman like her. And, I, and so that was sort of the beginning of it, of just how to, of taking someone who I never met as a child and who was really quite outside of a realm of anyone I think I would have known as a child uh, and, and trying to overlap that and think, thinking of how that could play out. But I do love the eighties. I mean, I love going back and thinking through, like I had a lot of fun going through old Barbie furniture pictures and uh, the, um, oh, let's see, like, yeah, the desert rose plateware in the kitchen and the banana clips. And I tried not to do too much with like shoulder pads and obvious things, but those details of the house that really was, happy. Rose was Desert my Rose. Rose pattern. I ate off <laughs> Desert Rose my whole childhood. She still has that. My mom probably has 400 sets of China because she's mine like, does as well. You can't, yeah. It's there's yes, we also have the mental, a really specific mental illness at work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I, when I saw that, there, the, that I was like, oh, I know exactly what that looks like with the pink, <laughs> frog woody looking flowers going around the thing. Yeah, it's very, 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 very specific. Um. One of my favorite aspects of the novel is that running all through it, her, her job is almost a character in that she has many, many cases going on. And we see little glimpses. Some, sometimes we just get 
a couple of paragraphs where you just open up the world of this divorce that's going on or that custody battle or, or whatever. And then there's a couple that we kind of follow through the whole book Mm -hmm. where you, you sort of get a sense of her job. And also they're like these little mini stories that open up um, the time period to us, the roles people were expected to play and are also just like interesting. It's almost like, you know how on on TV shows there's the overarching arcs and then there'll be just an episode with the client or whatever. Like it's standalone. Like talk, yeah, talk to me about how well, how you decided to structure it like that. I thought it was one of the hmm. hookiest and smartest things about the book. I really loved that. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the I added more about her job as a on a second draft because sort of for the reason you're saying, it occurred to me, this is so much a part of her. It's really, and it's another thing I, I don't see written about a lot is sort of the joy and satisfaction of a job you're good at and, and what that what that is. Um, so I, I and realize the way, what? Well, I, I think we do see that written about a lot, but not for women. Right, right. And I, that is another pet peeve of mine in books that they're, the career women are often supposed to be unhappy. I don't, I think that's an 80s term. Do we say career women anymore? Sure. Um, But but women with jobs are supposed to feel deeply conflicted and guilty and always go back and forth between work and family and never feel happy about either one. And, and that, and that is a totally valid experience and probably some part of many people's experience. But I also think there's a, yeah, a lot of joy, both in family and in work. Um, and, and it's okay to write a character who is fundamentally happy with herself. Uh, I would like to see more of that. I feel like in some ways, again, there's a sense when you read literature that women are, are destined to be unhappy with themselves. Um, wow. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think that is across the board. I don't think it's a mold that has to be has to be lived in. So I I wanted her job to be a source of joy and contentment as as her marriages. Now there's a bunch of other crap going on that causes causes stress and tension. But she's also someone who is fundamentally happy with the life she's carved out for herself. And those little middle those, why the stakes are so high when that life is threatened. She's not right. having her misery is not being threatened. Her genuine joy and contentment in a life that is outside of the expected mold that she has created for herself. What the hell? But I mean, she and her husband, that's a very good marriage, Um, which sort of brings me to my next question. And I want to just say, guys, go ahead and put your questions in the thing I want you guys to talk to. Um, Oh, good. We're starting to get some questions. We'll move to your questions in just a second, but I'm going to go ahead and ask this. Um, I, I thought you did a really good job of you know, there's this sort of societal expectation where men take their identity from their work and women take their identity from their relationships. And it's almost seen as emasculating if you're a man who takes identity from relationships. But I love that her husband has a lot of identity tied up in their relationship. Talk about that marriage because, you know, I, I do, I like I like a love story in a book and it doesn't have to be like a traditional romance. I like there to be a love story. And I felt like this book, one little thread that was in there was kind of the story of what happens to a love within a marriage. Like it was a, it was an interior love story. Talk about that relationship for just a minute. Yeah. I found that, I mean, I've been married now for 10 years, right? Nearly to 11. Um, and yeah, I think it's a different book than I might have written after a year of marriage that I and and did partly want to explore that too of just yeah that most of the love stories we get I think are um meet cute are finding it or falling in love and then it ends with like okay we're going to be together forever or it might be a marriage but it but there's but it's the destruction of a marriage and there are of course exceptions but uh but I like the idea of playing with a marriage that's not perfect and that does have tension and there is something to overcome, but also, yeah, the difference in a kind of love that is a long-term love. And as, as Lucia starts to think of it, what the, what the ebb and flow of that is. And it's also interesting, you know, in terms of being someone in family law, who's seeing the breakdown of all these marriages. So how do you feel, how has that affected your own 
view of marriage um, that I liked that. And no, I love Evan too. That's the other thing that I, that I wanted, you know, with that, it's not his story. And yet it was important that he feel like a real person with, with real opinion, valid opinions of his own. And that this very smart, very successful woman would have a spouse who she loves and who loves her and they navigate that and they're yeah you're you're right I don't usually it's it's this sort of juggling act and if you don't have if you have one you're kind of losing the other but that's not really that's not really present here like that's not the source of it's a pretty tense book but that's not where it's coming from that's what's right. being threatened I really liked that um so let's see Andromeda that's a great name hey, Andromeda um, says in terms of 80s time period Jen I'm sure there were lots of features you're glad we left behind us but what is there anything significant you wish we hadn't left behind something that made you nostalgic not counting pop rocks or banana clips we all miss pop rocks and banana <laughs> clips obviously but um but not counting those like writing this and re-inhabiting that time period what did you end up missing that's a really great question Andromeda that is really good um I thought a lot as I wrote this about what I miss that my child I think will never have is my connection to my grandparents and even great-grandparents how they were and this feels to me I don't know I mean your childhood apparently is basically my childhood so feel free to chime in um it felt like everyone I knew a knew at least at least some of their grandparents pretty well, and that those grandparents were often had a really strong connection to uh, to a small town or the country. That we were sort of one generation removed from that World War II generation that moved in big numbers to the city. And so I grew up in Montgomery. My friends all grew up in the city, but we all felt pretty close still to riding horses or going fishing or traveling out into the middle of nowhere to go in the, I mean, I went to my great grandparents' house for every holiday that my, he was a coal miner and he built the house in 1910. Um, and I, looking back, I mean, I found one thing this book really did was just make me think about how tight that connection was between urban and rural between generations wow, um, and how much that added. And I think the fact that we don't have that anymore is dividing the country in ways that are becoming toxically horrifying. Um, right, I think that really mattered to think of that if I went up to Walker County, sorry, that's sort of rural Alabama about an hour from here, um, to visit family, then they might talk differently. That's, they said ain't a lot more than I did. Um, they, most of my older relatives only had a high school education and, and I might tell some differences, but they were my people. They were still mine and I was theirs. And there was no discount. I could appreciate the differences in where we were and also feel like there was some connection. And I do think that was, that's hurting us now that there's this vast divide where maybe there wasn't one. He's Sorry, like, Pop Rocks and Banana Clips were like a way more cheerful answer. I, I still love Pop Rocks and I'm unashamed. <laughs> um, do you have the book handy right there? I do. Can you read just really quick the first, the, the quote at the front of the book? Lil Gibran? Yes, both of them. Okay. Your children are not your children. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. Khalil Gibran from The Prophet. Don't you wish you'd written that? It's so yeah. good. I mean, yeah. um, and then Maya Angelou, it's wise to know where you come from, who called your name. So Kate wants to know, did you have those quotes? Like, how did you choose the ones that, like, why are they there? How did you choose them? And did you have them picked out when you started or was it thing you, uh, something you came to in the process? That's a really great question. Really good question. Um, okay, I've never picked out an epigraph before I wrote the book or even early in the process. I think that would be awesome to do it that way. 
Um, but usually I start of some, usually what happens is I'm a little bored with the scene or I'm having trouble. And at some point it occurs to me, like I could spend 30 minutes deciding if I'd like an epigraph. And I, I do really like how they, how they center the book in a way. You, usually more like when I'm halfway done and I'm looking for ways to kind of figure out what lens I'm viewing it through is when I start looking for quotes I like. Um, it's funny, I loved the idea of having sort of an old Southern, that didn't sound right, um, a Southern woman writer, a classic, let's say that, Southern woman writer. And I love Eudora Welty. And I, I swear, I read everything I have by her trying to figure out a good quote that would work and never found anything. And just stumbled across the Maya Angelou quote, which was perfect. I really love the notion of, of naming. And then I have a I have a relative, someone on my husband's side, who had a baby and posted the whole Khalil Gibran, the prophet excerpt. Uh, I didn't know it at all. I read the prophet in college, but um, and uh, no, and saw it and was like, that's exactly what my book is about. And it was so exciting. So Audrey Alice, thank you very much for that. Uh, but no, it was, it was, especially that one was just sort of a freak occurrence, but it is perfect. Like, I, and then I stopped looking, I couldn't find anything better than that of sort of what, of what you are to your, to your, to your children. Yeah, that's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty spot on and pretty perfect. And it's also really, very interesting in terms of like, when you look at this young girl, Rachel, if you think about applying those quotes both to her biological mother and to this relationship she's having with this woman who is neither her mother nor a mother at all, mm -hmm. um, who is, you know, still young. And I, 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 thought, I, I, I thought it resonated in some really interesting ways. I thought they were great too. That is a great question. I do want to tell you that Eagle Eye Books um, has book plates. So if you are one of the first random number of book plates that they didn't tell me to order the book, you <laughs> will get a signed book plate copy. So that is the thing you should do now because I don't know how many there are. There could be one, there could be 10, who knows? Probably, probably it's very small. You should do it right it, now. You should do it right now. And also it's supporting Eagle Eye, one of our excellent independent bookstores that we love. And also like when we have events like, book sales drive events like this it makes bookstores more interested in helping support them and make them happen so if you want us to be able to do content it's important not to just be like oh i'm gonna go i'll just find it online later like support the bookstore who's helping create the content that would be really cool of you um so oh gosh we're running out of time and i, I have like some things i want to do and we have more great questions coming but I, we're gonna right now we're gonna talk about the audiobook we're gonna talk about it because um, it's awesome. It is awesome. I'm so excited about it. Tell me about casting the audio book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I do think literally before the book even went to my um, editors, I was like, oh, I would love for Jocelyn to read the audio book, but she's got a lot going on and she would feel obligated to do it. So I probably shouldn't ask her. And so then we got and like a year or whatever goes by with pandemic, like two years go by, how long this book has been finished forever. Um, and so then I got a, a list. I got a lot of people who had auditioned to do the audiobook, and some of them were lovely, um, but a lot of them were doing an accent that was a little more like Daisy yeah. Duke or sometimes Scarlett O'Hara between those two. Um, because and it was just, southern. they were doing a Southern They accent. were doing Southern, yeah. And, uh, and I complained about it on Twitter. I mean, that's really not where you should complain just normally, but this one was, was a, a delightful complaining on Twitter. Um, and somebody said, you should, you should really ask Jocelyn Jackson. I will, I will listen to any of her books. And then you responded on Twitter. I would love to do that. Um, and I was like, well, no, I've kind of accidentally asked her and don't have to feel guilty about it. <laughs> it was so, uh, so then, so then you did it. So it's so exciting. And, um, and Grace, so you're doing the Lucia parts and then Grace Experience, who is another voice actress and actress in general is doing the Rachel parts. She's great. Um, and I can't know. I'm so excited. It, it was you, Catherine Caldwell. I was trying to think of who said that. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, that, so I love to read audiobooks. I try to do just enough in a year to qualify for my SAG card because it makes me feel good. <laughs> And, um, and I don't, and it, this was like two weeks before Mother May I came out and I absolutely did not have time to do it, but I, I loved, I can't, I, I can't even tell you, you guys, how much I love this book. Like the, one of the, one of the things about this series is I'm trying to bring in books that I really, that really did speak to me on some level. Like, you know, these are obviously it's not like my favorite books of all time because you're looking for what's coming out now like that's what we want to talk about but this is going to end up being my favorite book of the year it just is like I can't tell you the level I love of- you so much so when I saw her say that on Twitter I was like no I want to read it. <laughs> I want to be at Lucia so bad so I'm going to tell you if I'm going to tattle on myself and tell you a funny story that's going to horrify you horrify you I love E.F. Benson. He's one of my favorites. I've reread. Have you ever read the Lucia books? Lucia in London, Map and Lucia. There's this, there are these British comedies no. okay. from the wars. Fantastic. The BBC made a, a show about them. I didn't really like the show, but I've read the books. So the whole time I read the book, I read it as Lucia, not Lucia, because it's the Lucia books. So I go in ready to read it as Lucia. And the director's like, no, that's not right. We had this meeting beforehand. She's like, it's Lucia. I was like, oh, okay. all right, I can do that. It's Lucia. The day before I'm going to record, she's convinced it's Lucia. At, at least that's better than Lucia. I see, I'm scrolling through Instagram and there's a independent bookstore in Alabama near your house. I see you doing an interview with them and you're saying, <laughs> and I'm like, that would have been- they were supposed to tell you that we actually also had that conversation me and the audio producers so but that they, was- they tell the director like the producers aren't in the session and the session is the actors and the director so it was almost lucia or lucia. that well it would have felt more italian then and I you can thank your <laughs> For saving you, or saving me from going back in and doing Lucia, Lucia, cut ins. Where they're just like, hey, on page 86, we're going to play the sentence now, say Lucia. Like that would have been another day of work saying the word Lucia. Um, Erica Swiler has a great question. Fierce Kingdom was such an immediate high stakes tension, whereas Family Law is an intricate, slow burn of a book. How do you, how do you navigate these different types of tension? Which it's true. Like I find both of these books to be really narrative dry. Like these are books with propulsiveness, but it is very different. Like Fierce Kingdom is, you know, you, you might need a Xanax. And this one is sort of this rising mounting. It is like a, those embers and you feel the ground underneath your feet is like the, there's a fire under the floor and any minute you could fall through it is a, a perfect slow burn talk about navigating that as a writer oh erica that's a hard question um i mean with with fierce kingdom so the, i mean the whole book plays out in about two hours and 45 minutes and so i did have a really strong sense there that there is no like every every bit of backstory has to be with the very smallest of touches um with this one yeah you know it's not there's no there are no gunmen chasing you it, it's not and i knew i didn't want it to be propulsive in that way i did want something with a little more build um and in some ways the build wound up i mean what what really set the pace or at least sort of the tone for me was maybe more Rachel than Lucia, uh, that part of Rachel's story is just that sense as a teenager where you don't know what's scary or not. And particularly when it comes to men, uh, boys, uh, to anything having to do with sex and sexual attraction that, that you just haven't figured out yet. What's the difference in flirting and stepping over the line? What's someone making you know what and some of this is your own confidence like that makes me uncomfortable that he just said that so does that mean it's okay for me to be uncomfortable or am I overreacting and so in some ways that drive is both because of Lucia's 
professional issues and she has like a much she has a much uh more direct threat that she's aware is out is out there but the pacing is a little more slow building dread in in the way with as we feel Rachel's First. uncertainty yeah of just what's I don't know is he dangerous is he not dangerous should I complain about this should I not and that's not some of those interactions are very quick. Um, one of them is a little longer term as she tries, and not all is bad. There's also just a boy that she likes, but you know, it's right in that phase where you're trying to figure out what all of it means. It's and terrifying in a different way to be yes. like a boy. <laughs> <laughs> but so I like, and that echoes somewhat with Lucia, just that the part of that dread and part of the slow burn is not really knowing where the danger comes from. So I liked that difference. In Fierce Kingdom, they're shooters. It's a gunman. Working, and you know where the danger is, right? And this one, um, yes, it's much it's much more uncertain, which is a different kind of, of dread. I also really liked, I thought it was really smart that there is this more concrete danger in that we know Lucia has probably through her job, we're not sure, but probably through her job, upset a person who is actively dangerous and who mm -hmm. engages in behaviors that are actively threatening. And that is sort of balanced by Rachel navigating these encounters. And like as an adult person living in what year is it? 2021? I've completely <laughs> lost track. As an adult person living in 2021, there are some places where you can be like, yes, Rachel, that is dangerous, you know, right. and then don't, don't go there. Don't do that. But you, if you've ever been 15, 16 years old and in that position, you know what that feels like. Or just if you've ever been if you've ever been female in America. Right, no, who doesn't go through that process? Just so you know, everyone, nothing terrible happens to Rachel. We're acting like there is, there are questions, it, but yes, it is not a book that revolves yeah, around any, any trauma. A child is going to be tortured in a murder hole. Right, no. <laughs> there's no murder holes. No um, murder holes. But there is sort of standard teenage uncertainty of whether this is smart or not. Yeah. Um, which, you know, who of us were always smart? Which has not changed. That has not no. changed. Wait, this book, one of the things I really like about this book, too, is my daughter is 19. And she and I ended up having a really good conversation because, you know, I tend to think, well, things are different now. And she, for her, she reads a lot of the stuff I read. She's great. She's so smart and cute and great. But she's like, for, she's like, no, mom, this is, this is happening right now. Like I have these navigations where I'm not sure. And um, she like where, where things you don't think could possibly be happening. Um, a friend of hers had a restaurant job where the manager, there was one male host and the manager came to the male host and said, a good idea would be, what if I, you ranked every female employee from their hotness to least hot and then I made you a t-shirt with those rankings. So when you seated people, you could tell them what level of hotness their waitress would be. Like that happened two weeks ago. Wow. <laughs> like in America. So like this is like, yes, the book is set in the 80s, but it's not, it's not like reading something set in the 1800s where you're like, well, the corset problem's not really relevant. <laughs> Um, Anna Shara wants to know how long it takes to record an audiobook. Um, three to five days, depending on length. Um, okay, a couple of things. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in. Um, also, make sure you click that eagle eye link and buy the book. Um, if you are just standing in your money room with your money shovel, wondering, what am I going to do with all this money? Shovel it at Decatur Book Fest. There's a link for that, too. Um, and then I thought that while we give you guys a chance to get your last questions in, Jen, would you read a little bit of the book for us? Sure. All right. So this is going to be very short. I'm reading literally one page. Um, so this is a kitchen scene. Uh, and it, it uh, 
I don't know, I love a good kitchen scene. Uh, to me, and, and we've got Lucia here with her mother. So, and they had, I mean, they, she, her mother is a, an affectionate mother and they have a decent, they have a good relationship, but there is, so their lives are very different. Uh, and so the scene is them trying to, is them making Sunday dinner and, and Lucia sort of trying to keep conversation going on in a smooth way. Um, I don't know, and I love, and I love the scene, I love, love the scene in some way, there, there, it speaks to me personally, but I also love the details of um, Pyrex containers and Ritz cracker toppings and jello salads with cream cheese on top. Uh, all, there are a lot of things that my grandmother used to make and uh, the kitchen itself feels familiar. So here we go. There was a reason that they talked in the kitchen. Dumplings and jello salads filled the empty spaces. The past could do that too. It was as if, it was as if the two of them were standing far apart, separated by a huge bedsheet, a wide flat expanse. One old story would fold up the distance, bring them closer, corner against corner. Tomato, her mother reminded. Lucia reached into the far right drawer where the sharp knife stayed and the lace curtains blew against her arm. Her mother had opened a window after all and the familiarness of it washed over Lucia. She knew this place. She knew the cereal cabinet squeaked, making it dangerous to snitch Rice Krispies, which were kept not in a box, but in a Tupperware cylinder in the wee hours of the night. In the drawer under the toaster, you could find every possible variation of aluminum foil, saran wrap and sandwich bags. Bacon grease was collected in a Crisco tin by the sink. The view out every kitchen window was all leaves and branches. The curtains were tacky, but she loved how the hot air blew through the mesh screens and the green of the trees pulsed. Most of the time, she could barely remember the girl who had lived in this house, but there were moments, lace fluttering, wind smelling of honeysuckle and bacon and baked lays. There were moments where she was right under Lucia's skin. I saw the piece in the paper, her mother said. I saved a copy. About the counseling center? The women who called had trouble with their husbands, I suppose, and you'd tell them if they should get a divorce or not? I'd tell them what options they had, Lucia said. If they wanted to leave, I'd tell them how to do it smartly. Like to take the children with them because judges don't like it when the mother leaves the children behind, that kind of thing. Such a fuss, our mother said. Lucia finished peeling the tomato, focused on the narrow margin between peel and flesh. I wish that, <laughs> I wish that we were in person. There would be thunderous applause. That was beautiful. <laughs> God, I miss all you people so much. I can't believe how much I miss book events, just being in a room with literati. We really do miss you. It's so different when you're just a little number on the screen yeah it's terrible I mean it's it one of the nice things about I don't know one of the nice things about being a writer is is being read and it's really nice to be present in a room with people who have like have been in conversation with the people we've been in conversation with for years okay a couple of things this is your last chance for me to remind you that you should go to the eagle eye link right there and buy a copy of the book and you should donate to the decatur book fest and i also want to tell you that next week nikki salceda will be here i know every single one of you perverts has watched bridgerton twice um not me i've only watched it three times anyway um it's kind of a big thing right now and so we have two regency books that um we're going to be looking at and these are both i love i love them both one of the one of the reasons i like this pairing so much is that this is a very this guys <laughs> it's hard to know left and right on camera this is a very commercial book this is a very literary book um and i love that we have that together i like that I like it when we, I'm a more commercial writer, Jen's a more literary writer. I like that those things can be present in the same room without people being gross about it. Like it's the, and not, not drawing those fake lines. We're both set in the Regency. This is set in the Austin verse 
And if you um, if you know who Anne de Borg is, if you have read Pride and Prejudice half as much as I have, this is sort of imagining her story. It is it has a fantastic um, queer love story in it. I love this book. Um, an Earl, the Girl, and a Toddler, which I have a really hard time not saying an Earl, the Girl, and a Toddler, but that's not what it is. It's just toddler. Um, also takes place in the Regency. It's also a great love story. And it is um, it is a it is it is the two people of color who are navigating um, the Regency period together, one from Jamaica, but it all takes place, of course, as these things do in London. And um, she's been, she was in a shipwreck and she ends up in uh, an insane asylum in Bedlam. And she only really gets out because of him. And so it's complicated. There was an arranged marriage, but I don't want to say too much. It's just like a super fun ride. I loved it. I loved both these books. So Nikki Salcedo will be talking with um, Vanessa Riley and Molly Greeley next week. Um, and I hope that you will join us for that. Nikki, are you there? Are you still I on? am here and you? I love your plug for these amazing books. And I'm super excited to um, have these authors in my conversation next week. And I did want to give a shout out to Andromeda who gave that great question earlier because of you all are thinking forward, this is our summer reading series. Um, I will be chatting about this book on June 1st. So we have so many great books that we've been reading all year. Um, so thank you, Andromeda, for visiting and us. And it's really, really good, Annie and the Wolves. I highly recommend. It is good. It's really good. Nikki and I have exquisite taste, if I do this. <laughs> Also, Nikki, I love that you're rocking your May the 4th be with you, Leah Hare. But I just wanted to, before we close out, say, Nikki, do you have any questions for Jen Phillips about her excellent book, Family Law, before we say goodnight? Um, I'd just love to know maybe the proudest part. Like, sometimes you write and there's a part of the book and you're like, it came out just exactly how I wanted. Maybe you could just end with that. I mean, I think it's, I read, I mean, the page I just read is probably part of the scene that I maybe like the best of anything I've ever written. And, and some of that is because I think it does, it's a bit longer than that, but um, I, because I think it does capture, and at least the way I wanted it to, uh, what it's like to love someone when it's not that easy to carry on a long-term conversation with them. Uh, and uh and again, there are a lot of textures about that that ring really true to me. You know, that's in some ways, it's the most you can hope to do, I think, with a book is to really capture a specific world, a specific time and place. And then kind of you throw it up and hope maybe that all of it comes together in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, but to try to capture the specifics of that, those four walls, um, at that time. I do love and their relationship with her mom. What? I do love that relationship that Lucia has with her mom. I mean, to the point that you said earlier too about, you know, how you, how you make your peace with someone you love, but when some of their opinions are repulsive to you. Um, I think that's a thing a lot of people everywhere struggle with, maybe particularly in the South. Um, with generational differences. And so, so yes, I think that seems hints at that. And that, but that kind of, you know, again, relationships are never simple or I don't know what ones are supposed to be. The dog's not that complicated, I suppose. But between humans, it's-, it's But the it's dog is not complicated. <laughs> the thing that you said about the mom, I'm hoping you'll help me be able to remember this exactly, but I loved it. It's when, you know, her mom calls her quite a bit. They're, she's that kind of mom and they're in touch quite a bit. And there's this moment where the mom laughs and you describe her laugh. What is it? Like it's a saloon she's girl. She's got a saloon girl laugh. Yes. Yeah. That um, makes, and Lucia's like hearing that laugh, that throaty laugh almost makes me like she loves that there's this person 
it, it, it's almost like there's a person inside her mother that her mother could have been if her mother had had Lucia's opportunities and it's present in that laugh. Like that, those two sentences. It's been, I would like to say it's been like a couple of months since I read the audio book and that was the last time I read the book. And I still remember that image. This is a book that will stick with you. Um, thank you, Jen. And happy book birthday. This is the first day that- Thank you. Out. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. It was so nice and so much fun. I wish I could see your actual faces and like, you know, hear you, but at least you're here and that's something. It is. Thank you, Georgia Center for the book. Thank you, Decatur Book Festival. And most thank you, Nikki Salcedo. And most of all, thank you, Jen Phillips for being here. Good night, everybody. Good night. We'll see thank you next you. week. Next week. Don't forget. <laughs>